Okay, I'm back. So, this one is a paper. It's done in L, I'm sorry, MLA format. Oh my gosh, look at that. Wow. Um, anyway, so uh, for my undergrad back in January of 2015, uh, it is a paper regarding Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. So if you want, you can go ahead and study that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. Uh, it, this was a paper, not the final paper, but it was one of the assignments due uh, during during the course um, for my biblical interpretation. Uh, one of my hermeneutic classes, uh, I took a few of them actually uh, in my undergrad and uh, in seminary. But this one comes from my undergrad. Pretty interesting uh, end time stuff, I believe, if I remember correctly. I haven't rehearsed this. So uh, I don't rehearse any of them, so that's why, I, and I shout and everything. I still don't know where the microphone is on this thing, so that's why it seems pretty choppy, and then I need to get a tooth fixed, and excuses, excuses, excuses. Anywho, <clears throat> real quick, works cited, MLA, so it's not bibliography or says reference, it's works cited. So the top one comes from a Catholic survey from one of their websites a while back in 2002 uh, from the EWTN, all right, and that one was 12th century saw 65%, I'm sorry, 20th century saw 65% of Christians martyrs, wow, okay, uh, and again, I, I use this quite a bit, uh, so I can address that later in another video. Uh, second one is uh, Duvall and Hayes is grasping God's word. Then we've got John Phillips exploring the Gospel of Matthew, an expository commentary. We've got Michael J. Wilkins from the ESV Study Bible on Matthew. And then we got Michael J. Wilkins again in the NIV application commentary on Matthew. Then we've got Firos, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, Zodhiates, Z-O-D-H-I-A-T-E-S, from the exegetical commentary on Matthew. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> Matthew 10, verses 21 through 23. Surrounding context and literary genre. That's the title. All right, here we go. The literary genre of the Gospels is overall narrative. Stories of Jesus, narrated by the authors of the gospel title that bears its name, at first glance the gospels may appear to be a type of biography or have biographical characteristics. However, there are some differences. For example, unlike modern biographies, the gospel according to Matthew begins with the announcements and deliveries of two births, John the Baptist and Jesus, followed by a brief discourse of goings-on during Jesus' youth. Matthew then jumps decades ahead to John and Jesus' ministries as adults. Theologians and authors Scott Duvall and Daniel Hayes reveal that ancient biographers followed a different set of rules and normally had a simple outline, beginning with the birth or arrival of the main character and ending with his death. Of course, with the Gospels, Jesus' death is not the end of the biographical narrative. His resurrection is... Therefore, the Gospels are not merely a type of biography. They indeed are a biography from ancient times. All right, so I didn't do the quote and quotes, but I'll have to do that. The discourse of Scripture for discussion comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 10, verses 22, sorry, 21 through 23. The targeted verse is 22. Quote, Now brother will deliver up brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another, for assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man come. End quote. Matthew 10, 21 through 23, New King James. 
Verse 22 consists of two sentences. The first assures the reader and intended audience that hatred is a certainty due to the speaker himself, Christ. The second sentence is a reassurance of some sort of salvation, albeit a conditional one. Both sentences begin with a conjunction, and, and but. The first conjunction points to a statement preceding it. This is verse 21, which details extreme family dysfunction. The second conjunction of verse 22 suggests a contrast to the first sentence, moving from a negative statement to a positive one. This sentence is sandwiched between two negative certainties, verses 21 and verse 23. Overall, the discourse is bleak with a speck of hope in the middle and is clearly futuristic in nature due to the five, quote, wills, unquote, it possesses. Regarding the speck of hope from verse 22, quote, but he who endures to the end will be saved, end quote, one may find it difficult drawing up a conclusion with so little to work with. At face value, one cannot help but have questions arise in their mind about this verse. Endures what? To the end of what? And saved from what? Is this spiritual salvation or physical? And what happens to he who does not endure? Is his salvation forfeited? The help needed for clarity is in the surrounding context. All three verses shed light on the passage and may reveal the intended meaning of the second sentence of verse 22. The first sentence of verse 22 speaks of persecution towards its listeners. Verse 23, which contains the first sentence after the highlighted phrase, quote, but he who endures to the end will be saved, end quote, also speaks of persecution to its listeners. Suddenly a theme has appeared. Persecution. Reading verse 21 by itself, one can suggest that this is a general statement of a particular time for people other than the intended audience. However, because of the conjunctive word, quote, and, end quote, verse 22, verse 21 and 22 do connect. Furthermore, when one discovers that punctuations did not exist for Koine Greek during the first century, not to mention chapters and verses, one cannot deny verse 21 is speaking of persecution as well. As a result, multiple audiences seem targeted. The apostles and Matthew's intended audience of approximately 8060. Most likely a church in Antioch. In addition to future believers. Thus the quote, he who endures to the end, end quote, does not seem limited to a specific group or time. Upon further expansion of the surrounding context, the discourse in its entirety starts when Jesus calls the twelve apostles in chapter 10, verse 1. Arguably, this discourse can start as far back as chapter 9, verse 36, and it ends in chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 10, verse 1 through 15 clearly address the near future for the twelve apostles. Verses 16 through 23 seem to be referring to the distant future not only of the apostles, but also to future generations up until the second advent. Author and theologian Michael J. Wilkins shares similar views by categorizing them as, quote, instructions for the short-term mission to Israel, chapter 10, verse 5 through 15, and instructions for the long-term mission to the world, chapter 10, verse 16 through 23, end quote. Verse 23's fulfillment came a few, a few years later. The apostles were not able to venture into every town in Israel due to the severe persecution that arose shortly after the birth of the church. Acts 2, 8, 9, 1 Peter 1. Verses 24 and 25 appear to echo the idea of future generations with the disciple-slash-teacher and servant-slash-master comparisons while verses 35 and 36 show redundancy to verse 21. Chapter 11, verse 1, ends the discourse of Jesus' instructions to the twelve. Continuing further expansion in regards to surrounding context, the phrase, quote, but he who endures to the end shall be saved, end quote, 
appears again in the Olivet Discourse of chapter 24. This time, when the phrase is used, the word, quote, will, end quote, is replaced with the word, quote, shall, end quote, in the New King James. The King James has the word, quote, shall, end quote, for both verses, and the Greek words are the same. It is also worth mentioning that the King James places a colon after the word sake instead of a period like the New King James, ESV, NLT, NRSV, and others. The NASB and the NIV have verse 22 as a single sentence. This information merely gives the person of study quick insight as to how the said committees interpret scripture. It's very uh, useful there. The Olivet Discourse is undoubtedly a prophecy from Jesus to his disciples. Even if one holds preterist views on this discourse at the times Jesus delivered this message and Matthew penned his message, it was still futuristic in nature. Scholars like John Phillips claim, quote, the interpretation of the Lord's words anticipates the tribulation age and that the prophecy of chapter 10, verse 21 focuses on the last days, end quote which are discussed in chapter 24. With the Olivet Discourse using the same phrase as in chapter 10, it would seem Philip's argument is a sound one. However, what Philip fails to identify is the distinction between persecution, chapter 10, and the tribulation, chapter 24. The persecution of the church started immediately after the church was born and has not ceased for almost 2,000 years. In fact, the most severe persecution of believers is taking place right now. We need to pray for them. According to a study on persecution by the Vatican in 2002, there were more Christians martyred in the 20th century than all other centuries combined. It's true. It sounds. I'll just keep reading. And to think this was before ISIS. Tribulation, although will include persecution, consists of global calamities, man-made and supernatural, and is said to be the worst time in human history never to be repeated or equaled again. As it relates to the highlighted passage of discussion, quote, enduring to the end, end quote, cannot mean physical survival until the Lord returns. That would force us to conclude that those who died during persecution will not be saved. Got a problem there. Chapter 10, verses 21 through 23 carry a twofold application. The first to Christ's 12 apostles, the second to all of Matthew's readers from his day to the last day. The authors and scholars' views mentioned all fit and agree with each other as long as they do not limit their view of the intended audience, such as John Phillips does. Personally, I agree with Dr. Phillips' eschatological view of Matthew chapter 10, verse 21 through 23, but I do not think it should be limited to only eschatology. The words of Jesus Christ's warnings in this discourse are still in effect today and will continue to be until he returns. And his believers must endure the hardships of this life throughout until they pass on into the next. All right, that was it. That was the end of that one. Um, might do my preterist paper next. Uh, not sure, but kind of reminded me of it uh, because I mentioned preterism in here. But anyways, that was that. Uh, quick assignment on uh, Matthew chapter 10 verse 22 uh, so there's I mean it's it, it's uh, it's hermeneutics so it may sound boring to most people you know you got to actually go over the surrounding context and just reading the paper may not help or clarify uh, you know things as much as other papers do uh, because with this one it helps if you open your Bible and follow along with the actual verses, reread them, read them along with um, this paper and other biblical interpretation papers, uh, because uh, 
you know, you're expected to already know the discourse or the pericope that you are um, addressing. So anyways, that's it. God bless you and be a blessing.